We're here with the uh, 2016 Ernie Kovacs Award recipient, Michael Asmith. And Michael, um, well, hey, welcome back to the Kessler. It's been Thank a couple you. of years since you've been here. Well, about a year. Right? Yeah, years, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Um, I know you don't get to come back to Dallas often, but is it fun to come back to Dallas, or is it so <laughs> different from when you were back here? Well, it's both. I mean, it's very different. I have no real memes left here. They're all changed everything's new but then everything's new so it's kind of cool to see um, I was interested to see the flying red horse stuck on top of in, in the front of the hotel <laughs> and not sure what the point of that is but it's cool <laughs> that they hung on to it and ha happy to see the freeways going across the river and everything but it doesn't look like Dallas that I grew up in so yeah completely yeah. different but it's cool so that's all good so I, I'm gonna ask with looking at what you're gonna be honored with tonight mm -hmm. um, Man, you've been decades and decades in dealing with inventive, unique things. When you and like William were starting out with all the videos, like what, what made you guys just decide to do something different? Like with Rio and all that. I mean, what, what was that impetus that made you just kind of take a dive out there? Because what you guys were doing, no one else had done at that point. True. Well, we also fell backwards into it. The guy that runs Island Records still does. I think he still does. Named Chris Blackwell was running Island Records when I delivered an album called, or when he asked if I would make an album, and I said yes, and on that album was a song called Rio. And he said, I think this is a good song, I think we could make something out of it in, a, in Europe if you'll make a clip. And I'd had any, it was, I didn't have any idea what he's talking about, a clip. And uh, he said, well, you know, you stand up in front of the camera and you sing, and, and then we send it around Europe, and because there's only one television station in each nation, like there's one in Italy and one in France and one in Spain, Germany. If it gets played, it almost assures a hit. I said, well, I'll go do it. <laughs> but I, again, I had no idea. I didn't say, what is it or anything. I just assumed that he was talking about something like a little mini movie. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been working with Bill, and so I called Bill up and I said, I've got this opportunity. Are you interested in directing this? He said, sure. So the two of us got together with my wife at the time, Catherine, and kind of hatched this idea for a little mini movie and put it together. And Bill kept saying, well, what about continuity? What about continuity? How are we going to make these images fit together? And I didn't know what he was talking about then either, about continuity. And he said, you know, the, the images have to fit. You know, you have to, if you're, if a guy's going out the door with a drink in one hand, it's got to be in the same hand when he gets on the other side of the door and you cut to the other shot. I said, well, I don't, I understand that, but I don't know how this fits with what we're doing. So I just had a list of shots. We went out and made them. When we took them into the edit bay and I put down, we put the song down first on the tape and we started dropping the pictures in. After about the third or fourth picture, we realized that the pictures were discontinuous, but the film wasn't. Mm. And what had happened is that the audio had taken over the narrative space. And it surprised us. And we said, well, let's just keep going. So we kept going, and the farther we went, the better it got. Wow. And it was just cooler and cooler and cooler. And guys started coming in from the edit bay and said, what is other edit bays? And said, what's this over here? And said, well, this is a clip for European promotion of this song. And after a whole bunch of dialogue, the whole studio had filled up with all the other edit bay guys. <laughs> all, of us were all, of, all of us were standing around looking at this thing like it was an alien egg. like. What has just landed? Because none of us knew. But by the time it was finished, it was we just couldn't stop watching it. We watched it over and over and over. Now, you know, it's time-worn now. I mean, because yeah. that, that was the 77 or 78, so it's been decades. But when that thing popped to life, it popped to life almost by its own volition. And I didn't make it up, and Bill didn't make it up and everything. We just were putting this thing together, and it just came up, like I say, uh, of its own volition, an invisible hand. And when it was all done, we realized, well, something happened when the audio took over the narrative. Something happens that makes discontinuous pictures connect to a continuous audio idea. Hmm. Of course, let this guy go by. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the thing that, that you have to ask yourself, and we did ask ourselves, was, will this work again? I mean, is that a principle? Or is that, <laughs> or, or is it not? So we tried it again, we tried it with a song called Rio. 
And by that time, the, the grammar of it had started to emerge, and we were thinking, you know, this is a real art form. This is a real thing. And then we heard other people doing it. We said, would you send us the stuff you're doing? And they were doing the same thing, and they were experiencing the same phenomenon. So it was pretty much, you know, it was kind of a, a landing, you know, kind of 12th monkey, no pun intended. And yeah. damn, I beat you to it. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> and and it was it was kind of that twelfth monkey, and you and you realize, wow, everybody's washing their coconuts out here. <laughs> this is cool. How does that lead though to Nickelodeon and like suits and business and turning into something so much well, bigger? Well, uh, that was um, that's a whole other thing. I write about it in this book that I just finished writing about the way MTV came to mind. It was I was driving along the road and I thought. What's the relation between this video and television and how it gets out? Because everybody kept saying, what are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with this? And Chris and his minions knew that getting it around uh, Europe would sell records, so that was enough for them. But in terms of what you would just do with one on its own that didn't sell records uh, or have a record company, which was, was a mystery. Well, why would you make one of those things? But when we started to look at the uh, opportunities, I kept thinking, if there was a way that people could see this, and this video, and, and it would somehow drive the sale of the record, that'd be good. So maybe, since there's a symbiosis between records and radio, maybe there's a symbiosis between video and television. Hmm. So I started looking around. Long story after that, you know, months and months and months, and lots of people traveling and doing stuff. I finally came up with the uh, uh, the right connections at Warner Brothers and American Express. So that's all the business suits came in. And I said, videos delivered on cable 24 hours a day is like a new medium. Or not a new medium, at least a great spin on the one that exists. And they said, hmm, really? <laughs> and I don't know about this. And they did that sort of thing. And but they started their research and everything, and sure enough, when they tested the whole format, kids loved it, eight-year-olds and so forth, and that, that's where it started. So it was very naturally evolved. There wasn't any more to it than that, but then, that, you know, Warner Brothers put tens of millions of dollars into making MTV come to life, but that's how it came to life. So dealing with those guys, how do you end up picking out of a hat some kid named Alex that has a crazy, wild, ridiculous script. Like, that's a whole nother spectrum of life that you dive into. Well, that's, you know, that's because I, yeah, I'm i more committed to the life of an artist than I am to the life of a businessman or a salesman or a, even a troubadour. I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in new and innovative stuff, how you build community, how you build a culture. Yeah, I go into cities and I say, what's the industrial base of this town? What's the tax base of the town? And they look at me like I'm nuts because it's like, you know about these things? And I say, well, I know enough to know that a city doesn't exist for no reason. There's some, some you guys are doing something here. And then when you see the great cities, Toronto's a great city, San Francisco's a great city, Paris is a great city. They all have this deep cultural base. And it inspires me to see, well, where can I fit? What can I do in that? How can I be a part of the culture building and the community building? Where do I go? In America, especially in our media centers, New York, LA, San Francisco, and uh, there are opportunities for doing all sorts of stuff, television shows and, and making up new media. And I was always looking for people who were on the edge of that. And Alex Cox and his guys, they were on the edge of it. And somebody gave me a script and said, uh, you should look at this. This is a different kind of movie. And I read it, and it was, and I said, well, let's see if we can get it made. And I went out and sort of rattled the doors of the office buildings again, and then they got the money to do it, and that, thus it was born. But then you dive into stuff like, you know, the, the part series and, and sketch comedy, a whole other side of things. But... That's a different type of people as well. I mean, yeah, those totally. are established people, and like, totally. would be. Yeah. Was it fun to dive into that world too, and kind of have fun with all <laughs> those great guys? Well, it's odd that you should use the word fun because the answer is no. <laughs> the answer is no. When you get into those new cultures and you're a stranger, you know, you're the guy that opens the saloon doors and everybody looks at you and yeah. draws their guns. That's the way that goes down. 
But once they realize that you're kind of on their side and you're interested in understanding what they're doing, then it, it mellows out. And it takes a, it takes a lot of adaptability, and you've got to be really mellow and kind of easygoing and and listen to what they're doing, listen to what they have to say, and then you just slip into the thing in a way that uh, is is really uh, natural and sort of productive. So it's not it's not it's not a lot of fun, but it's not hard. It's just it can happen. How long have you been writing, and when did you decide like you wanted to dive into, you know, the fiction side of things and, and create a whole, you know, with your first book? Um, yeah. yeah. What made you turn into a writer? Well, writing is my first craft, and by that I mean it was the first thing I could do naturally without any training. I didn't do it well, but I could do it, you know, and so I, 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 ju I just did. And getting my ideas down on paper and getting them so that they made sense to me. One of the things I saw was, oh, poetry is really cool because it supercharges the words and that's kind of good. And what do you do with poetry? Well, you're not going to sell poetry, but you can sing it. So I started, that's songs, and the next thing you know, you're just writing and writing and writing. And I never quit. And even when I'm trying to figure out ways to get uh, through uh, a new business deal or a new uh, production or something like that, it always comes back to the written word for me. I have to write it up. I have to make it work. And so books and everything fascinate me, especially fiction. I love fiction writing and I love, you know, making stuff up. And uh, it has stayed there as a kind of a continuous background to everything else that I've done. So it's, I haven't, you know, it's not a, another thing that I do. It's sort of like the only thing I do and everything fl flows from that. The, the settings in your books. Mid America for a lot of it, Texas for the last one. American yeah, Corpus Gene. Christi. Um, what made you pick those locations? Why well, not something I, crazier? <laughs> well, I, I know I, I know uh, a lot about Corpus, and I know a lot about that, and I know a lot about Texas and something of the culture here. And it was a good place to plant it, just because I knew so much about the background. And the big thing with writing that I've found is uh, you have to describe stuff. Describe, 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 describe. I've been working with an editor at Random House recently that I just have learned so much from, and he keeps, his his edits have gotten down to one word. He'll put a little bracket around a paragraph and say, describe. And I'll realize I haven't described everything. Well, you gotta know what you're gonna describe. If I walk in here, I say, there's a serpentine bar that's made out of marble sitting atop a white plexiglass curtain and some uh, white leather chairs with tall chrome stands with footrests on them. That tells you a lot more than, there's a bar with a lot of really cool guys <laughs> and uh, some booze and uh, you have to tell them what color the chairs are and so describe, describe. And by doing that you build it and when you do in that for fiction then you create the world. That's where you create it first, you describe it. But you have to have the spiritual side of it, I think, in your mind in order to do that. And then as you describe the action that takes place in those settings, that's when the spiritual thing starts to happen. Did you just get the time signal? We're I did, out. I did. But We're I've, done. I get one one last question. One more question, okay. So when it comes to, because you, you watched Ernie when you were younger. Oh, yeah. I watched every show. I just loved it. The minute guy came on, <laughs> the minute I saw the Nairobi Trio and some of the other stuff he was doing, I thought, okay, who is this? And just never missed a show. What does it mean to you to, to be getting this award? Because this is... A culmination of his career, but all the great people who have been a part of this before, and you're just another wonderful name that gets to be a part of it. But you've been an innovator the whole time, just like Ernie was. Is it fulfilling to be honored like that in that side of your career, and not just you know the Twelve Monkeys thing? You know well, I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, it you know it's it, it it there's an honor to it, but it's humbling in a way because what it does or humbling's the wrong word. What's the word? when you feel like you're part of a team you feel you know you're not you're not the star the center of attention anymore you're p you're part of the team and that's the way i feel here that's gratifying i mean you can imagine you you know you get you get a call from i don't know who it, who would it be uh, the, the cowboys and they say you want to come quarterback it's like yeah <laughs> you, you think i can do it oh yeah you're good come on and it's like whoa i'm there so that's the way it is you, you know it's really gratifying but it's not particularly, you know, you don't, there's no swagger to it. Who's your favorite Cowboy quarterback? I have no idea who the Cowboy quarterback is. I'm so sorry. It's perfect. No, I I'm think not it's a, a great football way. guy at all. 
I think it's a great way to end it. Uh, Michael, I appreciate the time. Thank yeah. you so much. It was good. Fun.